Welcome to Cherry Grove Friends Church. Today is Sunday, October 30th, 2022. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Faith expressed as witness. We affirm the sacredness of body, mind, and spirit, and the necessity for Christians to conduct themselves in a way that honors God. Out of respect for ourselves and consideration of those we influence, we refuse to be defiled by, oh, here's those words, salacious literature and amusement, and we, re inject, we reject involvement that could lead to drug and alcohol or alcohol abuse or to occult religious practices. We consider the body a temple of God to be well cared for with respect, the mind a gift from God to be developed for personal and social enrichment, and the spirit of an inner place for God to dwell. We're going to observe a moment of silence to prepare our hearts to hear from God following our first song. There are, uh, or I should say, there is a uh, scripture, uh, Psalm 42, uh, that several of our songs that we're going to be singing today are in that verse. And I thought I would just read it first, um, considering that the Old Testament is looking at what we now know in Christ to be the reality. So it is looking toward the living water that Christ speaks about, that we can be cleansed and, and uh, have a washing of uh, to it. So, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God, when I go and stand, excuse me, when I go and stand before him. Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how I used, used to be. I walk among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession of the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him, my Savior, my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon and the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mizar. I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives my life. O oh God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is your God? Where is the God, this God of yours? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him my Savior, and my God. This first song has a scripture that is interesting in that it talks about um, as deep cries out to deep, the beginning of it, in the waves of his mercy, his deep cries out to deep. 
that basically is that part that is using an analogy of uh, the cleansing of the oceans and stuff within us as we um, are basically sanctified and and redeemed through that living water. We're, we're going to start with a very meditative seeking of the Lord through a prayer of Come, Lord Jesus.
Holy Spirit. Will you read with me aloud together Psalm 149? Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. 
He crowns the humble with victory. Let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his faithful people. Praise the Lord. Lord God, we do praise you for who you are and what you have given us in joy to present before the nations both your righteousness, your goodness, your faithfulness, and your justice. Lord, we thank you that we are a gathered community because you have spoken us into being. Lord God, you have spoken to us to bring us to life when we were dead in our sins. You continue to speak to us to conform us to the image of your Son. You privilege us to be your ambassadors to a broken world who speak your words to that lost world. Lord God, we want to bring before you in prayer those who are engaged in that mission, both near and far. Lord, we know that we here as your church are a witness to the watching world, but there are those who have gone forth from us and are supported by us in bringing your words to others. Lord, I want to lift up all of those who are engaged in campus ministry around the country, who are bringing the word of God to uh, a place that has been uh, less hospitable of late. Lord, I pray for those of you, those who are involved in camp ministries, uh, in our own camp at Twin Rocks and at other Christian camps around the country uh, who are headed into the fall season and get youth groups and church groups coming, that they would be a witness to your, the unity of, uh, of your people in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, specifically, I want to lift up David Miller at Satellite Gaming, who we've had speak here. Uh, as the school year is in full swing, uh, I pray that the ministry of that organization would bring many to believe in your name. Lord, I want to pray for those uh, Living Waters Ministries and, and others that are uh, doing the, the work of bringing the gospel to uh, the tribal groups and First Nations uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, I would pray that you would bless their efforts and that the people in those communities would come to know you, uh, not as uh, they have been forced to in the past, but as you really are. Lord God, I pray for parachurch ministries like Johnny and Friends that we have represented in our congregation, that yet you would use that ministry to draw uh, families, individuals, and communities closer to yourself as a witness of how Christians care for those who are uh, disabled and disadvantaged in ways that we are not all. Lord God, I want to pray for ministries like Portland Rescue Mission and the Union Gospel Mission and Open House Ministries in Vancouver doing ministry to the, the houseless and homeless and transient populations in our city. Lord God, their work is hard. There is little success. I pray that you would bring great success and encouragement to those involved in those ministries. Lord God, I want to pray for all of those working internationally throughout the world, uh, in places where the gospel is welcomed and in places where it is rejected. I want to pray particularly for the churches and the missionaries working in Ukraine in the midst of war, uh, for those working in Iran undercover in the midst of revolution, for those in Russia under oppression, for those in Pakistan, for those in China who may meet underground in homes, in basements, Lord God, bring encouragement and bring great fruit from their labor. May many be added to your people through the efforts of those missionaries and churches. Lord God, we praise you for all of these people who have engaged their lives in the ministry of bringing your word to the world. And we stand amazed that we get to, in any small way, participate in that work. Lord God, make us faithful to those that we have around us that we would be no less missionaries than all the people who are doing that full time throughout the world. Lord God, make us faithful, make us bold, give us the words to speak and the opportunity to speak them. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and what you have made us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. 
going to have us read together Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 18. And then I'm going to, immediately after that, we're going to read that together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray Psalm 37 uh, as a prayer of confession and thanksgiving. Let's read this together. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all of the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Lord God, may we be a people of confession. May we not rely on our activities, as God has no interest in meaningless rituals. And may we be a people of confession who come before you humbly saying, we have sinned, for you have promised to forgive us. Lord God, may we have assurance that you have forgiven us, that all who call upon the name of your Son will stand blameless before your throne. May that encourage us to great boldness in our lives. Lord God, make us aware of the sins that we do not know have plagued us. Thank you for giving us one another to carry each other in our moments when we do not even know what we're doing wrong. Lord God, may we be open to the correction of our brothers and sisters. May we be aware that what they are doing is by your will and for our good when they correct us. Lord, may we accept the transformation that you wish to do in our souls, in our hearts, and in our minds. May we become the image of your Son as you use the word of God, your word, to do a work in us to transform us into the image of your Son. Lord God, I thank you for every person gathered here today. And I pray that as we clear our hearts and our minds and we come before you to offer thanksgiving and request and supplication and prayer, uh, that you would speak the words that we are to speak through us. That you would give us the awareness of what we should bring before our brothers and sisters, whether we should confess, whether we should be asking for intercession, whether we should just be sharing what you're doing in our lives. Lord God, make us instruments of your word to one another now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
Uh, the gospel reading this morning is Luke 19, 1 to 10. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He waited to see, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to murmur or mutter. Uh, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Thank you all for sharing your heart, your request with us, and thank you, Erica, for that prayer. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to have a re another scripture reading. I know we do a lot of that. It's because I believe the Word of God is powerful and does incredible things to us when we listen to it. Um, we're going to have scripture reading, we're going to do some more songs, um, and then we're going to have a time of open worship. Uh, if you're not familiar with that for some reason, this is the heart of our worship service, what we're doing right now, um, is we're setting aside the busyness of our lives, we're filling our minds with the word of God, uh, with the fellowship of the saints, with the praise of our God, and then listening for his spirit to speak. Um, and we believe that the Spirit speaks not just through the guy standing up front, but he actually can speak through you. Uh, so as we go into this time of, of reading Scripture and singing and worshiping God through, through, through both of those, and then sit in silence, uh, open your heart to what God may be saying to or through you. So let's read together Psalm 119, verses 137 to 144. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. They give me understanding that I may live. That in one of these verses, we are going to play and you will sing. So we get to hear you guys really well. Okay. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy. Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, All of the ground is sinking sand, all 
because it's talking about Jesus coming back and we're going to be going. And I think that's a really good verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound,
As always, my, um, my prayer for you is that you would do this thing that we just did every single day of your life. Um, 
fill your mind with the word of God, with the worship of God, with prayers to God, with fellowship with the people of God, um, and hear from the Spirit of God. Um, so uh, keep at it. Good job. Let's do it more. Um, th- thank you for th- singing. Like, I am so blessed by hearing you guys sing, and I mean all of you. This thing will not stay on my ear today. Um, I, you know, we, we learn as much from the songs we sing as from the, anything else we do. So I, I don't know if you guys notice, you're probably singing and aren't paying attention, but when I'm sitting over here and you guys are singing, and I, I like to turn around and look at you, and it is the most beautiful thing to see God's people singing his praise together. Um, so thank you. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is discipling me. That is the congregation doing work in my soul. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit this morning about discipleship and being discipled. Um, I, I read a lot of books, and uh, so I have had a lot of conversation partners who are dead. Um, uh, you know, John Bunyan and uh, Jonathan Edwards and C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and many, many other people. Uh, but uh, one very impactful book I read about 15 years ago is this book, uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, uh, by Gordon Fee and Doug, Doug Stewart. Uh, and one of the authors, Gordon Fee, uh, was a professor at Wheaton and then later at Regent. And I heard this story about him a number of years ago that when he would open his New Testament class, uh, he would start by standing in front of the class and saying, you will hear one day that Gordon Fee is dead. Do not believe it. Because I will be very much alive singing the praises of my Savior. Uh, Tuesday morning, I saw a headline that said Gordon Fee is dead. Uh, I do not believe it. He is very much alive, singing the praises of his Savior. And you know what? He is still discipling people. Uh, he is teaching seminary students. This, this guy was a Pentecostal, and he is teaching. I, I picked this up in a, in a Quaker seminary, and then it also was assigned at the Conservative Baptist Seminary I went to. Um, and you know what? This guy, he, he is demonstrating that the body of Christ uh, disciples one another uh, across all of our denominational boundaries. Anyway, it's great. Uh, so today... I, I, we're in Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, I have skipped over a chunk of chapter 7 because it's a long list of names and about where people live. Um, if you are upset about that and want to instruct me to do, preach expositional sermons on lists of names, let me know. I will do it. <laughs> Happily. And I will let the congregation know who requested it. Uh, so this morning we're in Nehemiah 8, and so where we've come from is, is the people of God have been kind of being restored over the, the, the course of Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, in Ezra, we saw the rebuilding of the temple and the, the re-giving of the law and how Ezra had to call the people to account for being righteous. Um, and then in Nehemiah, we saw the rebuilding of the walls of the city and how Nehemiah lamented before the king of Persia, and how God used even foreign conquering governors to bring his people back to a state of, uh, of being successful. Uh, and we saw Nehemiah having to call the people to account, uh, because they were committing the same sins that got them sent into exile. Well, now the people have settled in their towns. People have come into Jerusalem. That's what the rest of chapter 7 was. Uh, designing certain people to live in Jerusalem because the city was empty. And now we get to chapter 8. And this is where Nehemiah and Ezra show up together. And you have, uh, so you have a political leader in Nehemiah, and you have a spiritual leader in Ezra the priest, and they come together, the people are settled in their land, and what is the first thing they do? Verse 1. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand, and he read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. 
and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. They've finally gotten it. The city's rebuilt. Everyone's together. They get together, and they spend the entire morning listening to Ezra read Leviticus. Probably. I mean, he probably read Genesis and Exodus, too. Sound like a party? You want to do that? No? Well, let's look at what's actually going on here. So Ezra brings the book of the law of Moses out to all the people, and he's brought before the assembly. Now, those of you who have been sitting through our class at Sunday school the last few weeks will recognize that word as a fairly significant word. Uh, That word, assembly, is the word that we see in the New Testament when Jesus teaches on this thing called the church. That's the word church. We are the assembly. This was the assembly of God in the Old Testament, made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So I guess they had nursery care. But other than that, it's everybody. And they all hear the words of the law of Moses. So those first five books of the Old Testament very likely included some of the prophets at this point as well. They get together and they hear God's word read out loud. But they don't just read it, turns out. How do they do it? Verse 4, Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood a bunch of guys. I'm not going to try and pronounce all those. And on his left were a bunch of other guys. Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, all those guys, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. They're preaching sermons, guys. So the assembly gets together, they worship God, they listen to the word of God read, and someone gives the sense of what it means. Is this sounding familiar? Is this starting to sound like something you might do on occasion? They come together in an assembly, they listen to God's word, they read, explain, and respond to the word of God. This was the solution that Nehemiah and Ezra were putting forward for the problem that they had run into previously, which was that the people of God kept falling back into the very sins that they had been exiled for. So instead of doing what they'd done before, which was wait for it to happen, and then correct it, They're like, okay, we're going to renew this covenant. We're going to renew this thing that we've said we are as the people of God. And we'll actually see it next week a little more extensively that the people actually, we won't get to it this week, but they say the covenant with God that was at the end of Deuteronomy. They say that again. They make promises to God saying, we will be faithful. We will do all these things. They read, they explain, they respond. How do they respond? Verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and all the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the word of the law. Nehemiah said, Go. Enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So how do they respond? They weep. Why did the people of God weep? What do you think? I think Andrea's got it. They heard the word of the law and realized, 
I don't measure up to this. We ain't doing it. They realized this thing that God has called us to, to be the people of God, uh, that picture that was painted of the people of God in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, of what we were supposed to be like, we're not it. This has happened three different times in the Old Testament. The other two times it was kings who brought the book of the law out and read it to the people, and there's a mass repentance. People realize we're, we're not living up to this thing that we said we would do. But the teachers of the law, who are giving the sense of it, say, oh, you missed the point. You've missed the point. But repentance, that's, that's good. But this, this thing that we've been given, this isn't about weeping. It's about rejoicing. For though we don't measure up, God has made a great promise that will carry us into the future. So go, as Nehemiah says, go enjoy choose, choice food and sweet drinks. Have you ever said that to anyone? Hey, go enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Because this day is holy to our Lord. Is that what you think of when you think of a day holy to our Lord? Choice food and sweet drinks? Hanging out with people? Sending food to other people? Celebrating with great joy? I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that the days that are holy to the Lord, that are most holy to the Lord, that God takes pleasure in, is the days when we, as the people of God, celebrate together the greatness of our God. And so they are doing here. They respond by weeping, but then they are instructed, no, this is about rejoicing. Because while you don't measure up to what you should be, that is not the end of the story. And they don't just stop with food and drink. They all go camping. Verse 13. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the word of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. They went camping as a nation. And there's much to be said about what that meant, because God gave that direction so that they would remember that their ancestors were refugees who had to live in tents for many, many years. But I don't think that it is beyond us to take a little piece of, of the people of God camping out and having a barbecue around the campfire and sending choice food and sweet drinks to one another. There's nothing wrong with importing that a little bit to our own traditions and saying, you know what we can do? We can go have fun together. We can hear the word of God presented to us, recognize that we don't live up to it, rejoice that God himself will make us righteous, and then go have a party about it together. You know, if, if church in general looked like that, it might be easier to get people to come. Just going to throw that out there. Who's bringing a barbecue next week? No? Anyone? No. <clears throat> I, I seriously, I mean, we could do that. So all the people of God gather together in an assembly, listen to the law, the word of God, weep because they are repentant, but have explained that this is a matter of joy and they can celebrate it. And then they do it. And finally, verse 18. Day after day, from the first day to the last, 
Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Repeat until done. Here, get together in an assembly, listen to the law of God, repent, rejoice, party, eat, drink, celebrate, repeat until done. Repeat until done. Keep at it. The people of God, from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, had not done it. Joshua. That means all the days of the king. That means David never did this. It means Solomon never did it. In the days of the prophets. They did a great many things right. You know what they missed? The party. They missed the joy. And I, I don't want to read backwards that David didn't have any joy in the Lord. He definitely did. But it seems like one of the things, that w- one of the primary lessons, this book of Ezra and Nehemiah, is not to miss the party. Yes, repent of your sins. Yes, understand the situation you were in in the world, maybe as an oppressed group, as the, the Jewish people were then. But man, your God is awesome. And we should celebrate over and over. That line, they celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Well, that is both, I think, literal and figurative. They had a party for a week, but also when you see seven and then eight in the Bible, that means completeness. You know, God rested on the seventh day, and everything else takes place on day eight. It's a new creation. It's a reference to to Eden, to the perfect garden. So our celebration is looking forward to the eighth day and the new creation. And in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. The assembly word again. So, So what... What are we looking forward to in the new creation? An assembly. Of of who? Of, Of all of us. Of all God's people. And one day I will get through a sermon without referencing Revelation 7, but today is not that day. Because the great assembly actually shows up in the book of Revelation. When that great question at the end of Revelation 6 has been asked, the wrath of the Lamb has come, and who can stand? They've heard the law of God. They're weeping. We don't live up to it. Who can stand? And God answers it by showing John the great assembly. People from every nation, tribe, and tongue crying out salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. Man, it's something to look forward to. But it's also something to experience right now. You may not think of going to church as a joyous celebratory occasion, but it is. And God is most pleased with us when we are most satisfied in him. I'll just, I'll just quote John Piper. God is most, satisfied, most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. When all of my joy is focused on God, I think God's glory bleeds out of me everywhere. Just spills out. You can't help but notice it. So what do we do now? Well, you may be sitting here thinking, uh, you guys don't look like you're having a party. You might be sitting here thinking, what? What, what, uh, what, celeb- what is there to celebrate about what you're talking about? Well, my friend, if you are sitting here thinking that you see the assembly but you don't see the party, then I invite you to, to talk to the person sitting next to you or to me after the service, and I will tell you what there is to celebrate. Because the joy of the Lord absolutely is our strength, and the one in whom God rejoices is his Son. 
And his son is worth celebrating every day of your life. Or perhaps you're sitting here and you're weary because you have been coming to church your whole life and maybe you've even been the one trying to get the party started, but you just feel like you're running into a brick wall over and over and Ezra and Nehemiah know exactly what you feel. Because the leadership of the people of God throughout Scripture is the story of people trying to get the party started and running headlong into walls. We'll see that from Nehemiah in a couple of weeks. But you know what? It's not on you. To the weary, to the weary soldier who has spent their lives trying to get the party started, there is rest and joy in being carried in the arms of your brothers and sisters. If you've spent all your time trying to be the one making it happen, maybe it's time to let somebody else do it. And maybe you're the eager one. You're the eager one. You, you hear this and you're like, yes, yes, let's go have a party. My wife's sitting over here smiling at me. Yes, that's her. It's like we're, we're having a party. We're having a party. Let's go. Let's do it. Are you the eager one? Well, remember when you're the eager one, when you're the one who's saying, yes, let's go get the branches out of the forest and build the shep shelters and let's do the cooking and let's send all the food to everyone. When you're the one doing that, remember that you are not here to do it all by yourself. The people of God gathered all together to hear the word of God spoken. They go all together to sit in the shelters and celebrate the joy of their Lord. And your eagerness may be there in order for you to link arms with the other people sitting here and drag them forward. So if you are the eager one and you see the glum one or the weary one sitting around, grab their hand and pull them forward. They need you. You need each other. I'll return to Gordon Fee here. Um, so one of, one of the other stories about uh, Dr. Fee was that having told his uh, students that uh, if they read he is dead, not to believe it, but that he is very much alive, uh, he would leap on his desk and begin singing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. There was more joy in that guy than anyone I've ever met. And he was a stodgy old university professor. So if you think that you don't have that kind of joy in you, I invite you to the example of men like Gordon Fee and of people like the people of God in Nehemiah 8. Let's not forget the situation they were in as they went out to celebrate the joy of the Lord. This was a remnant people. There were few of them. They had to organize a kind of national lottery to figure out who would be stuck living in Jerusalem because it was so dangerous. They were oppressed on multiple sides, faced opposition. That's, that's been the story of Nehemiah, is the opposition Nehemiah faced. And it's not over. The opposition continues. So let's not forget that the people of God are always a remnant people, always faced with opposition, and yet we can leap on our desks and sing with joy. Don't leap on the chairs, and don't want anyone to get hurt. You can if you want. For the joy of the Lord indeed is our strength. It is what carries us forward. It is what enables us to listen to the law of God and not simply weep, but to rejoice. It motivates us to, to go out and enjoy our lives and bear witness to the watching world that though we are opposed and though we are a remnant, we have more joy than anything they've ever seen. And it is what pulls us together in an assembly 
of people who have nothing in common but Jesus Christ, unifying that which could never be made whole any other way. My prayer for you today, whether you are a seeker, a weary soldier, or an eager person to see a celebration happy to happen, is that you would do it together. Advance together. Move forward together. In joy, in repentance, in hearing the law of God, in assembling, in listening. We're going to have a short moment of silence, and then I'll read the benediction, and we'll have a final song. Let's reflect for just a moment on what God has said this morning and what he is saying to you going through the week. I'm going to read this morning from Ephesians 1, verses 17 through 23, while our musicians come up for the final song. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Would you stand with me as we sing the Lord's Prayer? And I'm going to actually ask a favor of my husband to stand beside me. Can you come up here, John? We were doing it with, with the music yesterday, and it, it's easier to just uh, do it the way we do it as a congregation. Okay. Our Father, which art in heaven, <coughs> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory is when we're having a celebration and we get to appreciate Mark and Laura Lee. And I'm excited about this. This will be a fun time. 
We've seen a lot of changes in the last year. Last year we did two pastor appreciations. We had Arden and Janet here and Mark and Laura Lee. Now this year we have Mark as our full-time pastor, no longer associate. Laura Lee is our full-time pastor's wife. <laughs> and we have Arden and Janet in Hawaii retired together. The moms have gone on to their to glory and they're with their spouses and life is good and Janet and Arden are having a time to see what it's like to be married to each other after 47 years. You know, it's just the two of you. It's a different uh, world. It's a good world. We like that world. As I was thinking about today, I was struck by the amount of answers to prayer that God has provided both to individuals here as our body and our congregation during the last year. And as Mark mentioned last week, he did have his second cataract surgery, so now he has two wonderfully working eyes, which is a really good thing. Plus, you're only 41. You, you beat it by 20 or 30 years for the rest of us, so good job. It is. That's, yes, that's you, ahead of the curve. So when, what they do when they do a cataract surgery is that old diseased lens gets thrown away and you get a brand new interocular lens. And you're gonna wonder, why am I talking about this? And I'll tell you. As I was thinking about having new lenses, I was also thinking about uh, something that occurred for Matt and I just three weeks ago. We uh, had been on a trip, we'd been in Florida, but illness came into play and in what we were dealing with and we decided we're gonna go home. In the meantime though, we needed a little bit of time uh, for some recovery before we did that and we were in Cocoa Beach. And as you know, if you know Matt Woolley at all, you know that he loves NASA and the whole space program. So generally in our retirement, it seems we've ended up in Florida to see friends and do things and what does that mean there in Florida? You go to Kennedy Space Center. And his tradition, our tradition, is that he gets one day to himself and one day I get to go with him. And as we got to the hotel in Cocoa Beach and he said, I just don't feel up to going tomorrow, I thought, that, that's a measurement tool. He's really sick. So the next day we, we got treatments, we got the drugs, and we changed our tickets so we knew, okay, we have a couple days here to recover. Um, the next day he was better and there had been a launch that was supposed to happen Thursday night. It didn't, it was going on Friday. We have a favorite hotel there at Cocoa Beach where we always get a room looking at the ocean, which is probably, I, I know that heaven's gonna be full of oceans because that's just so calming for some of us. Um, so we, he felt good enough that we went out on our balcony and he's re watching everything you know about the countdown and it's down to minutes and suddenly he looks again and it's down to 24 hours and minutes. So it had been scrubbed and moved to the next night, which was at the same time that we were taking off to come home. As we got on the plane the next evening, of course changes happen in the the seating sometimes, which was fine. We didn't care. We ended up with two people in three seats. That was pretty cool. But I had the window seat. That was wonderful. I, knew, I don't get that very often. And as we were taking off, I looked out the window. And to the right of the, plane, of the wing tip was the launch. And I said, man, man, you got to see this. And so we got to watch until it went out of sight. And at that point, I knew that was God's graciousness to us. He, he loves to give us those joy-filled moments. You can call them God's, God sightings. You can call them whatever you want. But I look at it as if I can recognize that from him, it's like an interocular lens. I now can see. And I was so grateful for that time when we were together. And yeah, we didn't feel very good. We had some recovery to do. But God just said, 
here you go. And I've heard that as I've been sitting in this room, sometimes on Sunday mornings, sometimes it's during the week, and he reminds me, here you go. Look around this room. That first Sunday we were back, I was struck, and it, it was emotional for me. As I looked at certain people, and I realized the answers to prayer. Now, it's important that we pray, but it's also really important that we recognize what he's done for us. And I want to just uh, mention a few of those things as we're sitting here today. Some have had some pretty frightening, maybe even scary medical procedures, but they're sitting here in this room or they're still a part of us. Some have recovered from their health issues that allow them to be here now, but they haven't been throughout the year or for a while. We've had um, some folks have had some new members of their families in the last year. How fun. Grandkids are great, aren't they? What a gift. Some have gone through some job changes. Maybe they didn't really want to go through or they didn't know how they were going to go through it. And now they realize this next job God had was better than they could have imagined. And so they're just having so much joy with this new life that he's given through them. Some have watched God uh, sweetly work out maybe a physical move, someplace they've lived their whole life, and now what will that look like? And it's been, again, better than they could have imagined. As we've all experienced this year, some have gone on to be with Jesus, and we miss them, but we know that they're there when it's our turn to go. And as I mentioned, some are in Hawaii enjoying time together. <laughs> so we have countless ways. And I encourage you as you're here or during the week, think about the, the here you goes that you've seen from God in this last year as part of our body. Laura Lee, 20 years ago I met you. And I think it was on your birthday. You're, we were with your parents in, at Sherwood and helping them prepare to move here to Battleground. And I, um, I think back to that of how the Lord knew what we needed. We didn't. We were a really hurting church in 2002. But he sent your parents who have made such a difference in our congregation and our personal lives. One of the things I love most is that your mom brought with her something I believe she'd done at other churches, the phone carrying ministry. And she had a team of people who would call. You know, they had their group and they'd call and they'd talk to us over the phone. And so it wasn't just praying for someone at church. It wasn't just huddling here. It was prayer over the phone, which for some of us was a new thing. I remember well many of those phone calls with your mom. And at that time, 20 years ago, a lot of our children were not married. So that was a prayer that we had, was that the Lord would bring that right spouse to them. And as she would pray for our family, I would pray for your family together. So Mark... You also have been prayed for for 20 years. That's half your life. It's no wonder you're the pastor of our church. So we want to thank you for saying yes to God and being a part of our body. Um, we appreciate you. We love you. And we celebrate that you're part of us. If you'd come forward, I do have a gift other than also the fruit basket. And I'd, <laughs> I'd also like the elders to come up, Rob, uh, Shelly, as the clerk of the meeting, Matt, if you could come down, and Rick, if you could make your way back forward, which you've done a few times. You, both of you. I'm using the mic in case he's recording it. I want to make sure everybody hears. Hi there. So I'm going to stand here and hand you that, 
And that should allow you, it's a favorite place, I understand, where you can go and stay, or you can eat, or you can do both, or what have you. I believe it's McMinimins. Is, no. is, did I hear? No. Oh, okay. Good. Nailed it. Okay. okay. <laughs> If you found this video helpful or enriching to your life, you may find more of Cherry Grove Worship Services at the following link. If you wish to contact Cherry Grove Friends Church for more information, please contact our pastor, Mark Franklin. If you wish to leave a prayer request, go to our website and click on How Can We Pray For You?